Hello and welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where each week, Pastor Jeff Cranston explores biblical theology that provides practical life applications in an understandable way. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Tiffany Coker. Along with my dad, Pastor Jeff Cranston, we are seeking not only to help you know deep, solid biblical theology, but to know the Word of God and the promises of God that are given to us in His Word, all while holding to solid theological truths in our hearts, soul, and mind. On today's podcast, we are going to look at a quite well-known New Testament letter of the Apostle Paul's in I think we might could even say it is one of the New Testament's most popular books, if you'll allow me to say that. It is the letter to the church at Philippi, known to us simply as Paul's letter to the Philippians. If you're new here with us at Kitchen Table Theology, we have been walking through every Bible book, discovering the theological themes contained in each book, along with sort of just giving a summarizing overview. So dad, let's just Go ahead and jump into the book of Philippians. Yeah, well, let's do that. Hello again, Kitchen Table Theologian. Thanks for joining us and checking things out today as we jump into another New Testament book. And I want to begin by sharing with you a true story. The story is related to us from an author by the name of Leo Bascaglia. And he tells a story about his mother and what they called their misery dinner. Their misery dinner. It doesn't sound that appetizing, does it? Well, they called it that because it was the night after his father came home and said it looked as if he was going to have to declare bankruptcy, go into bankruptcy, because his partner had ripped him off and absconded with their firm's funds. The money that he had in in this firm that he'd been working, it, it was gone. His partner had stolen it. So Leo's mother went out the next day, sold some of her jewelry, bought some sumptuous food and drinks for this huge feast that she was planning. And she invited friends and family. And some of the members of the family scolded her for it. You know, like you just found out he's going to have to declare bankruptcy. You're out here spending all this money and throwing a party. But here's what his mother told them. She said, the time for joy is now when we need it most, not next week. The time for joy is now when we need it most, not next week. And that true story reminds us of Paul and his letter to the believers in Philippi. And he wrote from prison when the time for joy is now. So it sounds like they maybe need to rename their misery dinner as a joy dinner. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what she intended it to be. All right, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians. Start with a basic question. Hopefully we might know the answer to this one. Who's the author? Yeah, well, thanks for beginning with an easy one. And the simple (laughs) answer is the Apostle Paul. And as I said, uh, I think when we did the podcast on Ephesians and some of these other books, there's always some people who want to say Paul wasn't the author, but the evidence is so overwhelming. It's not even really worth discussing. It's the Apostle Paul. Now, we know Paul ministered in Philippi during his second missionary journey. He had three, and he spent about three months there. And the ministry at Philippi marked Paul's entrance into Macedonia. And that came about as a result of a vision Paul had in the city of Troas, where he was told to go to Macedonia, which, and all of that geographically, wasn't really too far from Philippi anyway. So that's where he went. He spent some time there, but he's not writing from there. He's writing from prison. Okay, so quick question. Many of us have heard of Philippi. We've heard of this letter to the Philippians. But as far as the actual city of Philippi goes, where is it located? Or is it just not around any longer so we don't know about it? Yeah, good question. It's still there. Although Paul's Philippi, you know, first century Philippi is no longer a functioning city. Uh, it's it's located in Greece, not too far. Uh, I think if memory serves, 13, 15 miles, something like that from the Aegean Sea. Some major excavations started taking place in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, they got uh, paused because of World War One. They picked that up again. Then they got paused again with World War II. 
uh, but they have been ex- ex- excavating. That's easy for you to say, excavating <laughs> uh, Philippi, first century Philippi, and, and and it continues today. So the biblical city of Philippi, which is mostly ruins, uh, I mean, you, you know, you can go there and see these great ruins of this city. It's it's now presently, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And so, Tiff, the next time you're in Greece, you just can spend the day wandering around the city where Paul ministered. <laughs> yeah. Next time I'm swinging by Greece, I'll be sure to yeah. stop by. <laughs> so d- during his first stay in Philippi, because he also later briefly visited the city on his third missionary journey, so not to get too confusing, but the first time he visited that city was on his second missionary journey. And when he did, he brought a number of people to faith in Christ who eventually formed the core of this new burgeoning congregation in the city. And among them were Lydia, a businesswoman who opened her home to Paul and his co-workers, and the Philippian jailer who was converted under Paul's ministry after an earthquake miraculously broke open the prison. And you can read about all of that. All of these things happened in Philippi, and we can read about those two things in Acts 16. I would love to go to Greece one day. Maybe I can go see the city of Philippi, but let's keep going here. So Paul wrote the letter to the Christians in the city of Philippi. About when did he write this letter? It was around 61 or 62 AD. This is one of the four prison epistles. And most believe Paul wrote this one last, near the end of his imprisonment in Rome. Now, how did it get there? I'm always fascinated by this stuff, but Paul sent the other three prison epistles, and I wonder if kitchen table theologian remember what those were. They they were Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon, along with Philippians. He sent those three, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, by a man called Tychicus, because those three letters were going to places fairly close to one another. However, the letter to the Philippians was delivered by a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had gone to Rome uh, to visit Paul, to try to take care of Paul's needs, and he brought with him financial help from the church at Philippi. And Paul mentions this twice in the book, in chapter 2 and in chapter 4. But while he was in Rome, Epaphroditus took ill, which delayed his return home, and therefore delayed the delivery of the letter But as we know, he eventually got better, and the letter eventually arrived uh, there in Philippi. With that sort of brief background on the letter, let's turn and look at the content for a few minutes. Why is what Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians so important? Yeah, it's a little bit different from some of the other things he wrote. He, He didn't write the letter to the Philippians because he was responding to a crisis, as he did with Galatians and Colossians. And instead, he, he wrote to express his appreciation and his affection for the Philippian believers. More than any other church, I think, the believers at Philippi offered Paul material support for his ministry. So as you read through this very short book, it's only four chapters, we sense his love for them, not just because he lived among them for a while and visited them twice and wrote to them, but because, you know, we also see his his love for them because he mentions them to other people. And we read about the Philippians in the book of Acts. We read about the Philippians in Second Corinthians. And, and Paul has a clear affection for these fellow believers. And it, that comes through in, in the writing as he's encouraging them to joyfully live out their faith. We've mentioned it a few times now. So joy seems to be the main theme of this book. And really, Paul did talk about it so much, didn't he? Yeah, he, he did. Uh, he, he, You know, think of this. Paul wrote the letter to the Philippian believers while chained to a guard in prison. And the letter's central theme is joy. Just let that sink in. The central theme is joy. He writes this, chained to a guard in prison. That's pretty amazing to me. So, Tiff, there are two key verses I'd love for us to hear. How about How about reading those two verses for us? Sure. So the first one is Philippians 2, 17 through 18. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. 
And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. So that was from Philippians 2. The second verse here is Philippians 4, verse 4. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. So there you hear about joy. And I I think we can learn a few things from a man like this. While we're laying in our overstuffed, oversized (laughs) chairs, eating cookies and cream ice cream and binging Downton Abbey. I mean, this is what comes out of him when he's in prison. And and Paul throughout the books just takes the reader directly to Christ, teaching us that a community of believers living in harmony with one another comes only through mutual humility, which he tells us is, and shows us is modeled after the Savior. And, and Paul wrote in what you read there that he poured out his life as an offering for the sake of Christ, leading him to find great joy, great contentment in serving Christ. And his letter to the Philippians showed them that by centering their lives on Christ, they too might live in true joy. Yes, hard for us to sort of compete with that. He's in prison and has said, you know, he has found his joy. He has found true commitment. And um, not much we can say to that sitting from, as you said, our comfy chairs with our ice cream. (laughs) Yeah, and our three garages and one, you know, one of the garage bays is for a golf cart. And we're we're complaining about how bad we have it, you know. Right. So how about walking us through some of the key theological themes found in this letter? Yeah, good idea. We we should definitely do that. That's what we're supposed to do. Kitchen table theology. <laughs> yeah, we've finally gotten to it. So let's just stick with the idea of joy and rejoicing for a moment. That is the key theological theme, everything else is secondary. So those words occur, joy or rejoicing, more than or, or at least 16 times in, in this short letter. And this this letter is often known as the epistle of joy because it, it just pervades the whole letter. And Paul's rejoicing in every circumstance and finding joy amidst trials, That that's a major theological theme. And think about it. Paul had every reason to be discontented, to be upset by the world's standards, among many other things, because he's in prison for preaching the gospel, and and the powers and the authorities of the the Romans and even the Jews, I mean, they they just despise that. And so he's in prison for it. Well, despite his circumstances, he's still choosing to exude joy and thankfulness. And I do think it's maybe difficult for us to grasp how faithful he was to the Lord through all of this, mostly because most of us have never experienced this kind of persecution firsthand. When Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He literally meant every word of that. And I wonder if all of us can say that same thing and really mean it to the extent that Paul did. Yeah, that's that's a good question. It's an uncomfortable question, but it, it's a good one. Mm-hmm. You're, you're right. Paul meant it, and, and we know he meant it because we have a, a mountain of evidence that he, he lived that out. Right. What else should we know about Philippians? Well, we touched on this a little earlier, but I, I think we should take a moment with the fact that Philippians was written during his imprisonment in Rome. Paul, Paul was writing to the Philippians the majority of whom were Gentiles, during his first Roman imprisonment. It's it's a deeply personal letter, and he's expressing his love and gratitude and care toward them. The tone of the letter really contrasts some of Paul's other letters. And in this one, Paul comes across kind of gentle and warm. And I, I wonder if the flip, if the uh, Col- sorry, the Corinthians ever got a hold of the Philippians letter, they probably would have <laughs> You know, looked at the two letters they got from Paul and said, I don't, is this even the same guy? Because he was, he was just wearing the Corinthians out most of the time because, because they needed it. But the Philippians, it, there's a gentleness, there's a warmth there, and it, it feels a lot like a thank you letter. And, and so many of his other writings, he, he's having to take believers to task for what they're doing or not doing, but, but not in this letter. It's personal, it's uh, genuine, it's joy filled. And I have to ask myself that if I were imprisoned for preaching the gospel, would my top priority be to show joy and teach on humility and unity and contentment? If I was imprisoned for preaching the gospel and I was writing a letter back to 
Low Country Community Church here, I wonder how much of what Paul wrote to the Philippians would come through what I would write. It's incredible to me that while Paul had every earthly reason to pout, to be angry, to second-guess God's plan, he, he didn't do that. I, You know, the letter that I would write probably would be, look, y'all find the best attorneys. I need a team of attorneys. They got to <laughs> get me out of here. He doesn't go that route. He chose to rejoice, and he was very settled that this is where God has me right now. And that's a really hard thing for us to even imagine, must let's emulate. So instead of being filled with anxiety and fear, he chooses ultimate contentment and joy and, and prayer. That comes through, too. Prayer comes through, too. And that's difficult to find in our world today when it is painfully easy, it seems like, for most people to find something to complain about. You don't get that in what Paul wrote here. So I think another theological theme is the ability or the need for believers to rest in the sovereignty of God, to just, okay, this is where God has me. I'm I'm in the center of God's will. It, I'm sure to Paul, it, you know, that was no good. It was no fun. It was terrible. But he said, no, you know, this is where God's got me right now. And he accepted that. I was actually having a conversation very similar to that yesterday. Um, just on joy and peace, it comes from being content and being knowing that God's got you right where you are and he put you there mm. on purpose. And the study for the fruit of the Spirit's joy and peace was actually the, these verses in Philippians. So it's good a good reminder that Paul, and I'm thankful that Paul wrote this letter so we can still you know hear that today. But moving on, we know that these four New Testament books are called prison epistles. And you said in your comments just a minute ago, it, this was during his first Roman imprisonment. So it makes me wonder, I have to ask, how many times was Paul in prison? <laughs> yeah, it seems like every you're running into him so often, he, he, he's in prison. He's in prison. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy named Ryan Schellenberg, and he wrote a book called Abject Joy. And he tells us that not only was Paul imprisoned, but Paul was imprisoned a lot. Clement of Rome, one of the early church fathers, Clement of Rome, claims Paul was seven times behind bars, he says. Wow. Um, in Second Corinthians, Paul says simply that he experienced, quote, far more imprisonments, end quote, than any of the other apostles. I, you know, I was, I was in prison far more times than the rest of them. So I think the answer, how many times, we don't know exactly how many times. Clement maybe can prove seven, but he, he was in jail or house arrest or prison, for, you know, fairly often once he became a Christian. Well, thank you for that. C Kitchen Table Theologian, we can link that book that Pastor Jeff just mentioned, Abject, Abject Joy, in the show notes in case you want to do a deep dive on that. But Dad, how about leaving us with something that I think is interesting, not only historically, but also it relates to our theological themes here. Philippians contains what many Bible scholars believe to be an early Christian hymn. Mm -hmm. And I know you love your hymn, so I'm excited to hear <laughs> about this. <laughs> it's so rich in theology. So I'll read the verses and then you can maybe unpack it a little bit for us. So this is found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also... God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So Kitchen Table Theologian, if you've read through Philippians before or maybe many times before, you recognize those verses. That was a what most Bible historians believe, that was a hymn, possibly the earliest hymn of the church that we have, and multiple sermons or podcasts couldn't even do justice to all of the theology that's contained in those verses. But in closing today, let's summarize what those verses are 
our teaching. And even that's a little hard to do. So I'm going to turn to a fellow pastor by the name of Ray Fowler, Ray's down at Plantation Community Church in Plantation, Florida. And, and he draws out three concepts from these verses. First of all, he says, in the theology of all that, we learned that, first of all, there is no task too small to do for Jesus. There's just no task too small to do for Jesus. When, when you choose the path of humble obedience, as Christ did, no task is beneath you when you do it out of love for him or you do it out of love for your neighbor. So we're, we're called to serve each other in love. Jesus personified that, so no task is too small to do for him. Secondly, there is no obedience too difficult that God requires. Jesus humbled himself, Paul writes or shares in Philippians, and became obedient to death, he says, even death on a cross. So there's our example. No obedience too difficult if God requires it. And, and along with the command, God will give you, as he did Jesus, or as Christ said, the strength to obey that. And then thirdly, there's no reward so sweet as that which God gives. So no task too small to do for Jesus, no obedience too difficult that God requires, and no reward so sweet as that which God gives. Jesus showed the ultimate obedience, and he received the ultimate reward. You, you can't outgive God. You can't outserve God. You, you can't out anything God. And you, you and I are just called to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift us up. And so Christ in that book, in that letter of Philippians, he's, he's lifted up as the supreme example of humble obedience, because think of it, he started from the very highest place, heaven, and he journeyed to the very lowest place here on earth in a stable in Bethlehem. And, and no one traveled further than Jesus on this road to humility because no one ever started as high as he did or went as low as he did. And God calls you and I to have the same, that same attitude. So hopefully that, that gives you a little something to, to, to go on today. You know, reread that out of Philippians 2. It is just, uh, you know, those are some verses there that is really worthy of a of a deep dive. Well, thanks so much again for listening, Kitchen Table Theologians. Take a, just a moment, if you would, to rate and review the podcast, especially on Spotify and iTunes, as that's really what helps new listeners find the show. And we just want to spread the Kitchen Table Theology love. Don't forget, you can check out today's episode's notes as well, and we will link that one book for you. As always, we want to say thanks to our spiritual home, Low Country Community Church here in Bluffton, South Carolina, for making this podcast possible. You can head on over to jeffcranston.com for more information about Dr. Cranston, his books, sermons, leadership notes, and blog posts. And Lord willing, we'll be back next week with another episode, and we will head back to the Old Testament for that. So there it is. Now go deeper. And until next time, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, please check out our show notes. If you have a question from today's podcast, kindly email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.